Today, um, in the best politics week able to say has ever had, without the very, very hard work of our politics, of our national affairs officer, Max Lynn. So, big hand to Max question time after the debate. Um, there's a few interesting twists tonight. Um, you'll see some slips in front of you, they're voting cards for who wins this thing. So the first question you can answer right now, that's whether you came into this room supporting marriage equality. The second question though, do not tick that box. Um, it's about whether the speakers on both sides of the room convinced you either way or changed your mind. Because, you know, we're all here with an open mind, right? <laughs> of the other side's speeches to get up and respectfully offer a point. But the other side will have to accept that. So no heckling um, from, from each speak of the speakers and you know we're going to treat this like a like a formal and rational debate. So we're not just jump up and say whatever comes to your head. Um, but if you're in the audience you're very welcome to jump on Twitter and hashtag AUSA Equality Debate or Gay Wizards for Body. Um, if you would like to contribute in some way and you know get everyone get some buzz going about this in, in the stratosphere before we actually have question time. So without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce the first speaker tonight. Um, we're very lucky to have with us Louisa Wall, MP from Manurewa. She's a sponsor of Mary. <laughs> And thank you all very much for coming out tonight. Uh, just a few formalities. I want to thank uh, Arena and US, uh, the Auckland University Students Association um, and Max and the Fano here for providing the, the opportunity for uh, myself, Bonnie and Levi. And you've got to know that we're virgin debaters, by the way. <laughs> Three of us. Um, and and uh, in acknowledging our team, I want to acknowledge Colin, uh, Joe and Matt. So, uh, the, the topic that we're discussing tonight is that this House supports the legalizer or the legislation of same-sex marriage. Um, so what is marriage? Uh, for me, it's the meaning of life. And I truly mean that. It is the meaning of life. It's about finding the one person uh, who you intimately share the journey of life with. It's about commitment. It's about family. It's about love. It's the process by which two people who love each other make their relationship public official and permanent. Uh, so how do we marry in New Zealand? The starting point for this discussion is that only the state in New Zealand can issue two consenting adults and citizens of our country uh, with a marriage licence. This has been the case since colonisation in 1840 and we as a country regulated marriage by an ordinance in 1842 which imported colonial marriage. However, Māori customary marriage was not affected by this uh, regulation initially. The first Marriage Act was passed in 1854, in terms of us as an independent country, and from 1856, non-Māori residents had to give notice of their intention to marry and obtain a licence before any wedding could take place. So who can perform marriages today in New Zealand? Uh, there are two categories. The first is independent marriage celebrants, who have been able to do so since the 1970s, and the second is religious celebrants who are nominated by their church or religious organisation. So these celebrants are appointed by the Registrar General under Section 11 of the Marriage Act, and their names are published in the New Zealand Gazette and on the Department of Internal Affairs website. There are approximately 20,000 marriages in New Zealand annually, and of these, 30% are held in churches, and on average we have 9,000 divorces. So marriage as a social and civil institution is one that many cultures and societies have practiced and continue to practice. The churches at different points in time adopted and adapted marriage and continue to construct meanings around it. And I guess at this point I'm going to highlight, for example, the Anglican Church in New Zealand is in a two-year process of talking to their members about the role of homosexuals right across their church. And so they have Sarah Lynn Sachinand who's chairing that commission. And so they're having a dialogue 
So marriage existed first as a social, social and civil institution, and the first recorded marriage was in 2350 BC <coughs> in a place called Mesopotamia. It, had been, it has been incorporated and is, as I said before, practiced in many cultures and societies from its origins. But the context that we need to remember in New Zealand is that actually the state has only been uh, ever able to give citizens of our country marriage licenses. Um, the state, I believe, shouldn't discriminate against any New Zealand citizen. And so the state should really reinforce two fundamental principles of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Convention on Civil, Civil and Political Rights. And those two principles are equality and non-discrimination. So the opening words of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are unequivocal. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. So I believe human rights truly are the birthright of all human beings. So our system of government has a clear separation of church and state. Uh, we've never had a state church. The UK has had a state church, Denmark has had a state church, and they have, there's a different context and they're having different discussions, uh, particularly in the UK. Uh, what I do want to highlight is that the law has never defined marriage and neither has the court. The court has interpreted the 1955 Act to contemplate marriage being between a man and a woman and with the, within the context of home, homosexual activity between men being illegal in 1955, that was a convention only. Uh, the court said in the Coulter decision that given the intention and context of that 1955 legislation, it was a matter for Parliament to address. Hence civil unions in 2004, and today we are discussing the legislation that will facilitate marriage equality. So the legislation before this House seeks to define marriage as, be, as between two people, regardless of their sex, sexual orientation or gender identity. The 1955 Act needs to be updated to proper, properly reflect the society that we have today. And that includes families and relationships that are not as limited as the legislators contemplated in 1955. Yeah. And so there are existing limitations that remain unchanged, such as you can't have ancestral relationships, polygamy, polyamory, those are ruled out, they won't change. If people say that my bill is going to do that, uh, they're being disingenuous and they, I believe, are perpetuating propaganda, which is based on fear yeah. and hatred. Yeah. So, so this legislation will enable marriage equality between consenting adults, allowing two citizens to go to the state, which is the only entity in our country that can give you a marriage license. So for me, this is about equality of opportunity within the context of marriage. And so where have we come from to get where we are now? Okay, so um, New Zealand lead the way. In 1893, we gave women the right to vote. Uh, we want, we're one of the first countries post World War II uh, to help establish the United Nations. We were part of the writing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, so we have been uh, involved as a country in, in human rights struggles for a long time now. Actually, it's probably one of the defining things that sets our country apart. Uh, on our road, uh, we have gone through homosexual law reform, which happened here in New Zealand in 1986. So before 1986, two men couldn't have consensual sexual relations. And in fact, in, uh, in 1842, the punishment for having sexual relationships was death. We have the death penalty in New Zealand. And so in 1986, we went through homosexual law reform. I was 14, I don't remember it, and I think a lot of you in this room won't remember it, but there is a history of the struggle that our community went through to enable us to not, have, to not go to jail, that what we were doing wasn't illegal. Um, and it's particularly relevant because I believe this is a generational issue. So if you're over 55, and you're a male, you have a huge problem with my bill. I mean, that's the reality of some of the polls that have come out. Uh, in 1993, and I want to highlight this, it's very important, Catherine O'Regan pushed through, so New Zealand, our Human Rights Act, Section 21, the grounds on which you cannot discriminate. You cannot discriminate against someone because of their colour, because of so race, religion, 
uh, gender, we edit sexual orientation. So in 1993, Section 1 of our Human Rights Act, you can't discriminate based on, homose or on sexual orientation. Uh, in, in 1995, so almost 10 years post homosexual law reform, where we could live open on honest free lives, well guess what, we had three lesbian couples that went to their local registrar because they wanted to get married. They were denied that right because they were lesbians. So what did they do? They went to the High Court, they went to the Court of Appeal, and in fact they took New Zealand to the United Nations Committee on uh, the Convention of Civil and Political Rights. What happened in that court decision here in New Zealand is that um, the courts basically kicked it back to Parliament and said you've got to sort it out. Uh, but there was a very interesting decision. So, the, so you budding lawyers in the room, the Quilter decision, uh, minority decision by Justice Thomas, prima facie, uh, we are discriminating against same-sex couples because we won't allow them to marry. Uh, but what they did do was send it back to Parliament, and Parliament's solution in 2004 was to create civil unions. So they didn't address the issue that these three lesbian couples wanted to get married. They created another institution, and I guess at that time, and the polls were pretty clear, 40% supported marriage equality, 56% against, which is a different context to where we are today. 63% support, about 35% against, but if you're under 35 in New Zealand, 70-80% support. So this is really a generational issue, and the issue that I have with this issue is that actually this legislation is about you young people who are here tonight. It's actually about giving you that, that equality of opportunity and making the choice at some stage in your life when you find that person that you love, that you want to commit to, the ability for you to be married. Um, so I want to highlight, um, ooh, quite good when you start talking off the cuff. Uh, I want to highlight that equality is a key human rights principle. Does that mean one to go? Uh, a minute, yep. It's, uh, it is set out in Article 26 of the International um, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which we ratified in 1978. And it says that all persons are equal before the law and are entitled without discri any discrimination to equal protection of the law. And that's what we're talking about here. The equality under the law of New Zealand for all New Zealand citizens to be able to enjoy what is a privileged institution. Marriage is such a privilege. And I believe that in a modern democratic society, we shouldn't restrict the citizenship right of any, any individual uh, to the institution of marriage. And that's why for me it is a civil right. In other parts of the world, if you're mixed race, you can't marry. In other parts of the world, uh, they discriminate based on other factors. So my contention is, in modern democratic New Zealand, we shouldn't discriminate against anybody. keeping it claps but no heckling. We've got Colin Craig, the leader of the Conservative Party. Um, what, do you, what do you make of that, eh? No heckling. Love it. I understand it's question time at the end, so I look forward to that. Isn't it time to just uh, cut to the chase and cut the crap? If you want, if you want political mumbo jumbo tonight, you're not going to get it from me. Quickly to introduce my team. Next to me, Joe Sif Moinoe Colio. <laughs> he cuts to the chase too, and you can just call him Joe. He's a touch of cultural class to our team tonight. <laughs> he, he, has, he, he, studies, he studies and works alongside uh, students at this university as a chaplain. A man with more gay friends than a room full of fashion designers. <laughs> and, and some of you here tonight. 
And look, hey, understand, this is not a gay versus straight debate, is it? No. Yeah, I have gay supporters, and they don't want to change the definition of marriage. They respect what it already is. And he's all heart. And if you feel offended tonight, it's okay. Form a group, come and see Joe's. <laughs> Tonight, Joe's going to talk about what marriage is, its existing definition, yes, there is one, its value and meaning in which the idea of male-female partnership is central. And then on to my other team member, the esteemed, the honourable, Matt Flanagan, philosopher, ethicist, theologist, the author of various articles and research papers, and who even has his own blog. So if you insult him tonight, remember, he will have the last word. Previously president, previously president of a student association, he's well known at this university. And tonight he's going to deal with the rebuttal. He's hopefully, hopefully he'll have an argument to shoot down. He will point out the contradictions in a case which claims to be all about rights, but impinges on the rights of others. Hey look, a quick note, tonight, tonight we've decided not to take points of information because we have eight minutes to speak and questions at the end. We don't need to interrupt our opponents, we imagine their argument will be interrupted enough. And look, when I come back to Auckland University I think, gee, what did I get here, you know? A couple of degrees to put on the wall. What was the best thing about university? Was it all those friends that I made? No, I'm not doing on a secret. I met my wife here. And, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just to, just to set the record straight, she's a woman. The, the thing is, you actually knew that, right? When I said I met my wife here, you knew she was a woman. But I want to tell you, it's because you know what marriage is. The other team are about to suggest we change that. And I'm going to say to you, and our team is going to say to you tonight, there is just no compelling reason to change the existing law. And what does the existing law say? I mean, I, I, I listened to Lewis and here, and you heard mention of that big D word, you know, discrimination. Is discrimination going on? Is our current law deeply discriminatory and somehow doing something wrong. She mentioned the Quilta case. Well, what did that case say? Here we go, quote, the Marriage Act 1955 is not discriminatory in breach of the New Zealand Bill of Rights, nor in breach of the Human Rights Act, because all persons are treated alike. Now, she did mention the dissenting minority opinion of Justice Thomas. And I want to tell you tonight, that's about as good as their argument's going to get. A dissenting minority opinion. Hey, the European, the European Court of Human Rights. I've got one person entertained over here. Hey, the European, the European Court of Human Rights, the Dubois case, which was a French case, and look, it dealt with a, a same-sex couple who the French court said, no, you can't adopt a child, and uh, no, you can't get married. What did the European Court rule? Well, it ruled. It ruled. Member states' governments are not required to grant same-sex couples access to marriage. It's simply not discrimination. The UN Human Rights Commission, when the committee met, what was their ruling? They considered the New Zealand situation. New Zealand has not breached Article 23 of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights in not recognising same-sex marriage. So that's the legal rulings, but let's think for a moment. We do want to do it right, don't we? We belong to these international conventions. We believe in human rights in this country. We make an effort to get there. So what do they actually say? I noticed that Louisa quoted a couple of the introductory passages in a couple of those conventions. I was a little disappointed she didn't go on to actually talk about what they say in respect of marriage. Fortunately, I brought some notes on that tonight, so I can fill in the gaps. <laughs> the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says men and women are entitled to marry. The International Covenant 
of civil and political rights says the family is the natural and fundamental unit of society. The right of men and women to marry and found a family shall be recognised. And of course the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Men and women have the right to marry and found a family. There it is. Pretty simple. A man can marry a woman. A woman can marry a man. Hey, and don't be taken in by the smoke and mirrors and the wordplay of the opposing team. New Zealand has laws. These laws are entirely appropriate. There is nothing illegal. We are not a breach of any international convention. We have complied. The courts say we've complied. The wording of those conventions is clear. There is no case of improper discrimination and indeed the opposing team have only their own opinion. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the Marriage Act. We took the core provisions of that and we put it into another act. We changed the word marriage for civil union. That, ladies and gentlemen, recognised the rights of same-sex relationships. This here, the Relationships Act, made 160 legislative changes to make these two things balanced. It's a sign of intellect to recognise the difference between things. But it's also a sign of humanity to recognise the balance between the two things. Ladies and gentlemen, in this country, we have been intelligent enough to differentiate, but we've had enough heart to balance. We have also had the wisdom to avoid a myriad of downstream effects from changing an established social and institution that's been with us for a very long time. This house should be intelligent. This house should be just. Louis, Louis had 10 minutes. He got 10 and a half. So, so just, just, to, just to finish off, I thought I'd bring along a bit of a demonstration. Yeah. Soccer ball. <laughs> I knew you knew that, by the way. Intelligent. Rugby ball. Hey. Game, game, game played by two teams on a green field with the person scoring the most points winning. Game played by two teams on a green field. Person, team scoring the most points winning. Do we call these two things the same? No. We recognise there are similarities. Ladies and gentlemen, in this nation, in this country, in this country, we recognise similarities, but we also recognise difference. We legislated. We, we legislated and we did right. I ask tonight, be intelligent, be balanced, be just. We have addressed this issue in this country and we have done it appropriately. Thank you very much for that. Um, I hope you will jump on the social media and make note that Colin Craig just whipped out his balls. <laughs> My friend Samuel over here, he's, he's seven years old. Um, he is going around the floor collecting the flyers and uh, cheating on the vote, Samuel. <laughs> Nobody cheat on your votes and remember to not fill out the second question yet. Now Max, um, it's, it's timing, it's been pretty relaxed on the timing, but um, please be respectful of the, the speaking time, but yeah, we have been giving people a little bit more um, time if they need it. Our next speaker is from the affirmative team, her name is Bonnie Hartfield, she is the co-chair of Legalised Love and she is a babe. <laughs> Could the speakers from both teams stand between the widths of the desk, either in front or behind? We've got a camera to an overflow lecture theatre and they can't see you otherwise. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. I'm glad you think of me. Just between the lectures, guys, it's just going to slide together. It's so hard. Um, this, side, this side believes that love is love, and we believe that marriage should be legal between two consenting adults regardless of their sexual orientation or gender. 
I will speak briefly on the overwhelming support for marriage equality in New Zealand and the value of marriage as a social institution. Firstly, however, I'd like to rebut some of the points made by the first speaker. Watching that argument was like watching a really, really bad New Zealand's Got Talent audition. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. You've got to wonder how they ever thought it was a good idea to bring balls out on the stage. And the whole audience was just cringing. I mean, there's just so much wrong there that I really don't know where to begin. Um, I might just start with the institution of marriage. We on the affirmative team respect the institution of marriage. That's why we want to be a part of it so much. We value its meaning and its social value. That's why marriage isn't the same as a civil union, they're different socially. And I, like Colin, hope to meet my wife at uni. I'm bisexual, I'm a member of the National Party, I believe the state should stay out of our lives. And I mean, that's the bedroom. We shouldn't, the state shouldn't tell people who you can and can't have sex with. I mean, that's just ridiculous. And if you can't explain the gender of your partner to someone, you're not exactly doing a good job. I mean, it's pretty simple. And I don't think it's anyone else's business just to be honest. And um, the definition of discrimination, it's actually where groups are not allowed into institutions and are treated differently under law. I mean, a perfect example is same-sex couples can't get married in New Zealand. It's just a little bit of discrimination there. And so with some of that in mind, I'd like to move to a topic that hopefully won't give you guys a brain bleed. I support marriage equality, and I'm not alone. According to recent Colmar Brunton polls, over 60% of Kiwis believe that LGBT people should have the right to marry the person they love. An overwhelming number of youth across the country support marriage equality. Even the majority of those surveyed in traditionally conservative provincial areas support the right of LGBT people to express their love through the institution of marriage. And these numbers have been consistently rising over the years. This widespread support reaches across the political spectrum, with all major political youth wings, even New Zealand First Youth. And a majority of MPs across the board expressing their support for this bill. Even amongst those with religious or spiritual affiliations, roughly half of people surveyed supported same-sex marriage. Despite the best efforts of some people to make it appear otherwise, most Kiwis know that marriage equality is the right thing to do. Most people I've spoken to can't believe that it's even an issue and that we still have to fight for this shit. Sorry, sorry Samuel. We live in an inclusive, accepting society where being LGBT is not only tolerated, but accepted and embraced. And our social institutions should reflect that inclusivity and acceptance. Which brings me to my second point. Sexual orientation is like height. You can't control it, but there are some people on the negating team who would like to think that you can. It's not a result of abuse, or your parents behaving sinfully before you were born, or the household you grew up in, or your mum having a Mars bar on the 15th day of gestation. <laughs> nobody chooses to be LGBT, just like nobody chooses to be straight. It just happens. We are born this way, plain and simple. Sexual orientation is a result of a complex array of biological factors, most of which aren't well understood. Again, another basic concept some members of the negating team fail to grasp, like basic science. <laughs> Even if you accept the ridiculously flawed premise that sexuality is a choice, what right do we have to discriminate against their love? How is the love of two people any less valid because of their sexual orientation or gender? How is, what right do we have to deny these couples the ability to make a lifelong commitment within already existing social institutions like marriage? Well, to put it bluntly, it's not, and we don't. Marriage isn't just about a piece of paper and some sweet as tax breaks. It's a social bond that reflects the lifelong commitment and connection between two individuals who love each other very much. It provides stability for families and social recognition that can never, ever, 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 ever be achieved with the civil union. Marriage is a social institution, is valued and respected, and LGBT couples just want to be a part of that social institution. Including them in the institution of marriage will not dramatically affect its meaning or the value we place on it. No marriages will collapse because two dudes down the road can marry, or I can marry a chick. This point's been acknowledged by a number of liberal and conservative political leaders, including some conservatives like John Key, David Cameron, and Malcolm Trump. In countries where marriage equality has been achieved, the number of heterosexual marriages has actually increased. We should be encouraging people to make commitments to one another, to support, nurture, and care for one another. The only threat to modern marriage is a lack of commitment, and I don't see the other side advocating to abolish it and um, divorce. So knowing all of this stuff, why are we still discriminating against LGBT relationships in New Zealand law? It's just ridiculous, and we don't believe that we should. As the Member of Parliament for Hanua expressed in his speech in support of Louise's amazing bill, there is no way to construct a strong enough intellectual, moral, 
health or spiritual argument against marriage equality. This side wholeheartedly believes that. We support marriage equality and we sincerely hope you do as well. Thank you. thanking Max and the team at AUSA for inviting me to participate in tonight's debate and I also want to commend Louisa and her team for joining us in this most interesting discussion. Now if I know Auckland Uni students well, I suspect that a good many of you, when you arrived here tonight, said to yourselves, you know what, I'm going to check my views at the door and I'm going to judge tonight's debate as objectively as possible. And friends, we welcome that challenge. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, is this really a rights and equality issue? What exactly is marriage and what is all this fuss about? More importantly, what compelling reasons are there for us to redefine marriage? These are fundamental questions. So in tonight's debate, I'm going to approach this not so much from a theological perspective, as you would expect from a chaplain, but philosophic, uh, philosophically from the standpoint of reason and argument. Friends, I don't have any crude language or quick wit, so forgive me if I fail at my audition at AOSA's got talent tonight. But what I'm trying to do is just present uh, just a few facts that will support our, our argument. We on this side of the house are convinced from the weight of the facts that the argument opposing the redefinition of marriage is considerably stronger. You'll recall in our first speech when Colin opened our case that we are here tonight, that we are going to argue tonight two basic contentions. Firstly, that there are no compelling reasons to support the motion to legalize same-sex marriage. Secondly, that there are very good reasons to oppose it. Now, we've left it to the other side of the house to provide us with comparably good reasons to support this motion, but so far, the burden of proof has not been met. So in light of this, I'm going to firstly examine a little bit of their opening argument, and then I'll expand a bit more on our team's case. Consider then our opposition's first contention. Colin explained when he opened our case the differentiation and, uh, and the difference uh, between differentiation and discrimination. Bonnie didn't really answer that. She came out with uh, some pretty cool comments and how uh, homophobic it could be for, for us and how she doesn't get how stuff, but she didn't answer the premise, the premise that Colin uh, put forward to us tonight. Now, despite our opposition's best attempts at framing their case with pretty slogans like human rights and marriage equality. I don't believe for a second, ladies and gentlemen, that, that we can be so easily swayed with these red herrings and misleading catchphrases without first establishing whether they can justify these terms. Now, thank you. Look, here's this history lesson on submitted marriage practice and New Zealand's role in women's suffrage. It was nice, it was informative, but a speech laden with motive catchphrases, ladies and gentlemen, there's a little bit of a wee problem with that. It has nothing to do with tonight's debate. Okay? The Honourable Member came out tonight and on numerous other occasions. <laughs> stating that marriage is a human right and fundamentally about choice and fundamentally what drives her is equality. Well, ladies and gentlemen, her argument is fundamentally flawed on several counts. For starters, there is a huge flaw in the way that she and many others are using the word right and its application in this debate. Folks, marriage is not a human right. Time and again we hear this line that two people who love each other have the right to get married. But if we examine the logic of this phrase, it's not true. Not all persons can or should get married. Are we to say that those of us like me who are single in this room right now are being deprived of my human right? No, not all persons can, of course not. What many people fail to see, however, is that there are already prescribed limitations on the institution of marriage, even before the same-sex marriage question came into play. Limitations that aren't a denial of human rights. For example, siblings cannot marry. <laughs> Someone who is already married cannot marry. More than two people cannot form a marital relationship. A couple cannot marry without required documentation, etc., etc. Without even exploring gay marriage, ladies and gentlemen, we can already see that marriage has therefore in itself inherent limitations which cannot be violated if two people 
want to actually get married. It logically follows then that marriage is not actually something that is afforded to anyone by right, but on the condition of them being able to meet the requirements necessary for a marriage to exist. Now as it stands, the term marriage equality is, an, is both vague and misleading. Senator, Den, uh, Senator Dean Smith, who himself is a gay politician from Western Australia, also caught, caught wind of this and said, quote, I reject the suggestion of marriage equality. Marriage equality has been a slogan, a campaign, a claim to equality ignores, that ignores the widely accepted fact that marriage is an institution that has a long and well accepted definition. He goes on to add that despite this view, uh, he disputes the view, sorry, that the inability to utilize the Marriage Act restricts the quality of life of his gay countrymen. Here at home, New Zealand's Attorney General, Chris Finlayson, also gay, also voted against same-sex marriage. What does this tell us, ladies and gentlemen? It tells us that opposition to this bill is shared also by our gay friends as well. It tells us that our gay friends recognize that marriage, what marriage is, and what it was made for. It tells us that just because people like me disagree with same-sex marriage, it doesn't give you the right to call me homophobic or to say that I'm being discriminatory. Discriminatory. <laughs> If, if, if so, then are gay people who disagree with this bill also homophobic? If we follow that line of logic, obviously not. So that logic is gone. So I'm sure you would then agree that in order to determine what is considered equal treatment, we would first have to know what marriage is. To speak about marriage equality without first understanding what constitutes a marriage is to put the cart before the horse. Contrary to their views, marriage is not only about two people who love each other. If it was, then by all means the state would have no business in interfering with the love life of its citizens. But the state does get involved and does pass laws regarding marriage because it recognises that as an entity, marriage has served a particular social purpose for thousands of years. That's not to deny how important love is in the marriage, but romance itself does not form the entirety of the institution of marriage. Ladies and gentlemen, what marriage is, in the words of Oxford University Law Professor Jim Finnis, is the union of a man and a woman who make a permanent and exclusive commitment to each other, of the type that is naturally, inherently fulfilled by bearing and rearing children together. Now, folks, I seem to be running out of time. Um, to the joy of some. But um, let's, uh, let's keep going on with the definition of marriage. Dr. Alan Keyes from Harvard University states that to redefine marriage is to, in fact, negate its necessity, since the only reason why it has existed in human societies and civilizations is to regulate, from a social point of view, the obligations and responsibilities attendant upon procreation. So the argument can be um, summarized as follows. Premise A, universal human rights are universal rights. B. Marriage is not a universal right because it doesn't, as we've seen, apply to everyone. Therefore, see, logically, the conclusion is traditional marriage does not deprive same-sex couples of a universal human right. Now, if we look at another premise, another syllogism, for example, secondly, a, a component of marriage's definition is the ability and principle to procreate. B, a same-sex couple cannot procreate, whether incidentally or in principle. Therefore, C, same-sex marriages do not fit within what marriage actually is. So ladies and gentlemen, we've yet to hear tonight any compelling reasons to support this motion. For our part, we've laid out before you a comprehensive and factual case on why we do not support the motion and why marriage must remain as itself. The rebuttals and points of argument we've received are shallow and fallacious, and in the words of a, fa uh, a favorite professor of mine in philosophy, Several, several fallacious arguments put together don't make a sound argument. As such, they must therefore concede that there are, in fact, no compelling reasons to support same-sex marriage. In order for them to convince us otherwise, they'll need to start refuting our points logically, tearing down each of our points of argument, and in their place, erect a logically airtight case of their own. If and until they manage to do this, we maintain, and it is deep, indeed more rational to assert, that there are no compelling reasons to support the legalization of marriage.
from the affirmative team. Um, he is AUSA's Queer Rights Officer this year and for next year as well. He is Levi Jill. Please come in. Welcome. Um, now I could stand before you today and start engaging in the semantics about what marriage is or isn't. I could stand before you and start going around in circles on the philosophical and moral arguments about the issue. But I'm no philosopher, I'm certainly no masterful debater. I'm just a young gay man who wants the same rights and recognitions that the heterosexual majority in New Zealand already have. Wrong. I'm not going to spend this debate making the issue about me. I am, however, going to talk about the students that I represent on campus in my role as the Queer Rights Officer on AUSA. And oh, by the way, Mr. Colin Craig, um, I am really glad you've met your wife here, and I want to meet my husband here, and the students that I represent on this campus and vice versa. Among the many uh, other, uh, gender and uh, sexual identities that I represent as Queer Rights Officer, I represent students who uh, identify as gay and lesbian. Uh, those are students who are physically, emotionally and, and sexually attracted to members of the same sex. Currently, these students are treated as, they, as if they are second class citizens in this country. They are denied the same rights and the same choices as their heterosexual peers, simply based on who they choose to love. So they don't choose to love because it's homosexual is not a choice. We currently as a society are telling these young gay and lesbians that they will not get the same recognition as their heterosexual peers. Now I've heard a lot from, the, um, from those opposed to marriage equality about family values and morals, but I wonder if it is acceptable or moral to deny these rights, these young New Zealanders, based simply on their sexuality. Because to be quite blunt, I think it's Personally, I think it's one of the most immoral things that we are currently doing in this country. Homosexuality is not a choice. There is no medical evidence to suggest that it is. I don't get the, a choice between liking men or women. That choice argument is not only, is not, only not supported by a shred of current or relevant medical evidence, but it also is one of the most illogical arguments I've ever heard. Why on earth, in, under current New Zealand law, and uh, culture, would we uh, choose to be gay when we face the current discrimination in the law? There's just absolutely no reason uh, why you would do that. Now, there is nothing wrong with the fact that I am physically attracted, physically, emotionally, and sexually attracted to members of the same sex. I'm not ashamed to publicly admit that. I'm proud of who I am. The quote Lady Gaga, I was born this way. <laughs> Had to get a Gaga reference in there. Now, not all young people growing up in New Zealand are proud of their uh, sexuality and proud of who they are because they face inherent discrimination in the law. It's easy to understand why homosexual men and women do not feel positive about themselves, and it's easy to understand why the rates of suicide, self harm, alcohol, and drug abuse is so high, so disproportionately high for our queer members of society when they face this discrimination. But New Zealand, the good news is we have the chance to change it. The time has come, come for New Zealand's laws to reflect our acceptance of homosexuality. Because as a nation, we do accept homosexuality. We all know somebody who's gay. We all know someone who's lesbian. Whether they be a brother, a sister, a cousin, a work colleague, a fellow student, we all know somebody who is. And there is nothing wrong with them. There is nothing morally deficient with who they are. Despite what the Conservative Party or Family First might think, we don't actually have a secret agenda to indoctrinate children and encourage everybody to be homosexual. <laughs> Legalising same-sex marriage would not change that. We are just asking for the same rights and options that all heterosexual people in this country currently have when it comes to marriage. Now, I understand that marriage isn't for everybody. Some people choose civil unions. Some people um, in the gay community might not um, want marriage, and I can understand why gay members such as uh, Chris Finlayson, or in the case of the person in Western Australia, oppose marriage equality. It's not for them. I'm not here to say that every gay person should get married. I'm here to say that every gay person should have a choice, just like the heterosexual people. <laughs> the 
There is absolutely no valid moral, legal, or ethical argument as to why homosexuals should not have the right to marriage, and I've yet to hear one. I understand uh, that you know there, there are some ideas presented, uh, but these are uh, around the issue of marriage. But these are deeply flawed, and I want to address a couple of really quick ones. The first one is uh, the issue of marriage equality and, and the Christian tradition. Well, the issue of marriage equality is not one which is any way, shape, or form related to religion. Now, the opposing, uh, the uh, negating team might not like to uh, acknowledge this, but marriage actually predates Christianity. I'm sorry, Christians, but you don't own marriage. <laughs> Early Christians married under Roman civil law. Okay, so it's not a Christian institution. So let's just clear that up straight, straight up here. Furthermore on the issue of, of religion and churches and marriage equality. If marriage equality was to be achieved, no church in this country would be forced to perform a same-sex marriage. You know why that is? Because no church in this country currently is, is forced to perform any marriage that they don't want to uh, perform already. Um, and that stayed the same under civil, your, civil uh, union legis legislation, and it will say, stay the same under marriage equality when we achieve it, which will be around about next year. <laughs> um, now, I must say that you know that we often hear about biblical reasoning, uh, reasonings against marriage equality. Uh, that's also illogical because, thankfully, we're not a country governed by the Bible. Because if we were, polygamy would be law, and same-sex couples with simply practicing homosexuality would be put to death. We've moved on since then. <laughs> Trying to argue what is morally acceptable in New Zealand based on the Bible is also a very flawed way of uh, arguing about morality. Now I just want to come back to marriage equality. Ext by extending marriage equality, New Zealand as a society is fully accepting that your sexuality will not be an obstacle to your full participation in society. Because currently, your sexuality is still an obstacle to your participation in society. And now, let me just address a point. The slippery slope argument. The idea that somehow the legalization of same-sex marriage would lead to the legislation, legalization of bestiality, incest, or polygamy. Now, these guys haven't gone this far, but just, uh, this, these guys haven't gone this far about the issue of uh, bestiality, but just last week in Australia somebody did. So I want to I want to focus on the argument of incest because that was brought up tonight. tonight. Now first off, comparing same-sex marriage or my sexuality to incest is actually firstly deeply, deeply offensive and it's wrong to do. This, it, it, this argument is completely out of step with what we as New Zealand society believe in. We do not accept incest, I uh, don't think we ever have. But since 1986, we have legalised homosexuality. And I know that the majority of this country, because polls have shown it, support same-sex couples and they support their right to marriage. So if you support their right to marriage, I don't think you have that much of a moral problem with what they're doing. Um, Am I out of time? No, okay. Um, okay, cool. If we have to believe that there is nothing morally wrong with our young, gay and lesbian teens growing up, if we as a nation are to believe that there is nothing wrong with who they are and that they deserve the same rights and choices as every other young person in the eyes of the law, then we as a nation must legalise same-sex marriage. The debate, however, is not about forcing my liberal morals, or some might say homosexual morals, upon others. It is simply about New Zealand as a nation sending a message that the love between two people of the same sex is no less valid, and that deserves no less recognition than the love between two people of the opposite sex. And I believe that as a country we do accept that to be true. The time has come for homosexual couples to receive the same rights and recognition of their heterosexual peers. The time has come for New Zealand, uh, in New Zealand, for same sex to be legalised. Thank you. made a note on your card, you have Levi's number. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the next speaker is the final sister to speak for the evening. Um, he's an organized theologian, ethicist, and blogger. 
Um, his name is Matt, Matt Flanagan. Please give him a real round of applause. You'll notice that Levi just rebuffed the whole lot of arguments when he were raised. <laughs> <laughs> why I think you shouldn't support same-sex marriage, and then I'm going to respond to some of the um, arguments that have been put forward by the affirmative. The main argument here tonight is the appeal to equality. Lewis's bill states its purpose is to ensure that the Marriage Act's provisions are not applied in a discriminatory manner. Marriage is a social institution and a fundamental human right, and limiting that right to one group in society does not allow for equality. And she said tonight that we should not discriminate against anyone. Notice the unqualified nature of that claim. However, if you turn to Schedule 2 of her bill, it contains a list of prohibited degrees of marriage. Fifteen different groups of people are explicitly excluded from being allowed to marry on the basis of kinship, and Sections 4 and 5 mention you exclude unions that with, there are more than two people. Here's the, point. Here's the point. It does this whether these unions are consensual, whether the parties in question love each other, whether they're committed to each other, or whether they're citizens of New Zealand, which are all the features that they mentioned tonight as being relevant. Consequently, the bill itself explicitly applies the law in a discriminatory manner, and it limits the right to marry to only two groups in society, while excluding many more. Here's the issue. If equality is a valid basis for rejecting the Marriage Act as it stands, then it's a valid basis for rejecting Louise's bill. And note here, I'm not making a prediction, so the arguments of Louisa and Levi, this is a slippery slope argument, are flawed. My argument is not that if we recognise same-sex marriages, then in the future the state will recognise incest or polyandry or polygamy. My point is rather that the justification that put forward employs premises which, if true, logically entail that they should do this. Now, Levi finds this offensive, but notice, that's the whole point. He cannot in good conscience accept the logical implications of his position. He thinks it's offensive. And by the way, saying I'm offended is not a rebuttal to an argument. <laughs> now some rejoin that same-sex marriages are different to incest and polyandry, and these practices have features which mean there are good reasons not to recognise them in law. I'm inclined to agree. But notice, this supports rather than rebuts my argument. It shows one can legitimately apply the law in a discriminatory ma manner and deny various groups of people a marriage license despite the fact they may be low, consensual, between adults, don't harm others, or by New Zealand citizens. Consequently, the issue is not discrimination, love, consent, harm, or citizenship. It's whether there are good reasons apart from these things. So all the arguments for equality tonight are recurrent. So the appeal to equality is unsound, it's contradictory, it's a red hearing. However, even if it were sound, it's not sufficient to redefine marriage. Because, as Colin pointed out, under the Civil Unions and Statutory Relationships Acts, same-sex couples already have been given recognition and all the rights of married couples. The only exception are adoption and international recognition. Now, international recognition of same-sex couples depends on other jurisdictions. <coughs> it's not really up to the Zealand government to decide. Um, and adoption rights can be granted by simply appeal, repealing the Adoption Act or changing the Adoption Act, which is something that Arden is trying to do at the moment. Neither of these measures requires redefining marriage. So here's the issue. How can giving someone the same rights as everyone else not count as equality just because you give them the package a different name? If I call a chair a duck, it doesn't flap and quack. Right? <laughs> Similarly, if I use the word union to refer to a set of rights, it doesn't mean they don't exist. They do. And equality does not mean that you could give everything the same name. I'll give you an example from law. The Domestic Violence Act protects people from harassment given um, directly towards them by domestic partners. The Harassment Act extends the same protections to everyone else. So by the affirmative's logic, the Harassment Act is discriminatory and we should redefine what a domestic partner is to ensure that everyone has equal rights. <laughs> this is absurd. Right? The fact something is a different name doesn't change the substance of what it is. <laughs> now, Levi mentioned, um, Bonnie mentioned that the prestige marriage has, but marriage has that prestige because of its history and tradition, and these are the very things that they're saying we should change and reject. So it's, in, it's inconsistent. Here. So not only is their argument contradictory, and not only is it such that even if it was sound, it wouldn't justify their conclusion. 
But doing so actually has the potential to threaten other people's civil liberties. I'm aware of three legal opinions on Lewis's bill. All agree, all of them agree, that if churches, as many do, make their ceremonial spaces or facilities available for weddings, they can be compelled to officiate same-sex weddings. All agree that individuals who work in an industry which involves participation in marriage ceremonies will be, can be required by law to participate in them, even if they have religious objections to it. Now, compelling someone to engage in a religious or quasi-religious ceremony that they don't believe in is a paradigmatic violation of freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. And so for this reason, the proponents of the bill have exclusively focused on whether ministers can be compelled to do this. But ministers are not the only people in our society with freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. Freedom of religion isn't the right of ministers, it's the right of all citizens. So the bill therefore threatens people's rights on the basis of a contradictory red hearing and even if it was sound, it doesn't even justify its conclusion in the first place. That's bad legislation. So what is the basis for justifying this? Well, we were told we need to reflect what happens in society. Why well, society has a lot of single people in it? Our society has a lot of single mothers in it? So are we going to redefine marriage to include single people and single mothers? I mean, that would reflect society, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, it has to reflect society. Everybody in society is a member of society. Um, Lewis uh, gave us a long talk about the history of the struggle to legalise same-sex marriage. That's interesting, but it doesn't address the point. Um, Bonnie told us that this is like New Zealand's Got ta Talent. Very funny, it doesn't address the point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Bonnie said the state shouldn't tell you who you can and can't sex with, have sex with. It doesn't. We're not talking yeah. about the decriminalisation of homosexuality yet. Talking about whether we should recognise these unions as marriages. They're not recognising marriages, it doesn't mean they can't have sex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give another reason is that a large number of people believe in this. As the assumption here seems to be that if a large number of people believe in something, it's just. But I don't believe that, and neither does the affirmative. I mean, in 1955, a large number of people believed that homosexual conduct should be illegal, and Lewis said that was wrong. Right? Um, Levi brought up this issue of you don't choose your sexual orientation and attacked an argument we never made. Yeah. Um, he said he's not going to argue, he's just a gay man, and he proceeded to not argue. <laughs> <laughs> and then he talked about indoctrination and the Bible and indoctrination in schools and, and all these things which were never actually brought up by our side. <laughs> so we've had this debate like this humorous, it's funny, it's enjoyable, but in terms of the actual reasons given for the moot, Some, some really interesting comments. You give it to them, don't worry at all! <laughs> <laughs> and some useful contributions from people diving out the door. No. Here, here are the, here's the simple lay of the land as far as the debate has gone tonight. We have said that marriage is a unique institution based on a relationship between a man and a woman. We've pointed out that civil unions provide full recognition of same-sex relationships. In fact, this Act is based on the same act, uh, wordings. We also pointed out that it's intelligent to differentiate between two things, and in this country we have done so. The opponents claim somehow, however, this is inappropriate discrimination and a lack of equality. Well, hey, the courts disagree with them. The international conventions disagree with them. 
Our team disagree with them, but who are all of we to stand in the way of a determined and passionate individual who thinks that they somehow must be right? They also claim this overwhelming public support. Well, why then not, Lewis, put it to a referendum? Yes. I think we know. Everywhere in the world this has ever gone to a referendum, the people have said marriage is between a man and a woman. And to make the argument that it's all about public support, as we said, that is just not sufficient. Back up your words, put it to a referendum. Well, Levi thought uh, that marriage was not religious. Um, I, I think that's a bit weak given that so many marriages actually are performed by people who hold religious titles. So we get to the end of their uh, list of objections and what have they said? Oh gee, somehow it's discriminatory, somehow we should change it. Uh, why? Well, because we're going to make a funny comment. Look, the reality, the reality is this. We've addressed this issue in this country and we did it smart. We gave the same legal rights. I'm sorry if they don't think that the word union has quite the same meaning as the word marriage. But understand this, marriage is a word built on a tradition, built on a definition, built on what people have in terms of a religious, historical, cultural and personal stake in what it already is. They claim that changing that won't make a difference. I'm sorry, it's just not what marriage is. We've recognised the rights. We have done well in this country to do that. It's intelligent. It does not make sense now to somehow ask this House to support the legalisation of same-sex marriage. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. for voting after the last meeting. Um, I will now invite Lewis Wall back to give you her thoughts and that will be the end. key points, um, one of which um, Colin mentioned about the European Court of Human Rights, uh, the gas uh, and Dubois versus France decision. Uh, the context of that decision is really um, important. That uh, court was established in 1959 and it has a convention on human rights and article 14 of that convention outlines what the grounds of discrimination are and they are these, skin colour, sex, language, political or religious beliefs or origins. The reality of that context is sexual orientation isn't included uh, and so they couldn't rule uh, in favour of that couple because it's no ground. Uh, I want to highlight uh, section 29 of our current marriage act uh, which says if two people have a licence to marry it, it doesn't oblige a celebrant or a minister to solemnise that marriage. Uh, what we need to be uh, aware of is actually for ministers uh, the access for two people who want to marry uh, to go into that sacramental space of a church is actually mediated by the minister agreeing to marry them. And the interesting thing about the decisions that Family First or the legal opinions that Family First have highlighted uh, is that the Human Rights Commission have already come out and said that the sacramental space uh, in a church is a private space. And the only way that two people who have a marriage licence have access to that sacramental space is through a minister. If a minister declines to solemnise that marriage, there's no way that you can hire the church in that sacramental space to get married. Uh, there is another space that some churches have, however, which are uh, buildings that are attached to churches. So they may be church halls. Now the reality of that space, if the church hires it out, then they can't discriminate. That's the current law. Under section 21, you can't discriminate. But the sacramental space of the church, nobody can have access to that uh, without going through the minister. I want to talk about the two principles that I talked about earlier that my bill is founded on, equality and non-discrimination. 
the equality that I talk about actually is about equality of the relationship. The equality of the relationship that two consenting citizens of our country have. Now, polygamy <coughs> and the reality of polygamy, it's men with lots of wives. Now, that's not equal. And it's actually a throwback to uh, the position that women have in societies. And there are some societies around the world that allow polygamy, but the reality is it's an abuse of women. The other relationship where we have... The relationship of incest, I believe, is a power relationship, and again, it's not equal, it's premised on abuse. So, um, those arguments, I believe, are central, uh, were central to their, uh, their case. What I want to talk about, actually, is the fact that the world is growing up. The whole world has gone through a process at one stage of marginalising homosexual people. Uh, and in fact, what is, is relative to our discussion is in fact in Argentina, in Belgium, in Canada, in Denmark, in Iceland, in the Netherlands, in Norway, in Portugal, in South Africa, in Spain, and Sweden. Over the last 12 years, those countries have grown up. And what have they enabled? They've enabled citizens of their country who love each other to marry. Where is New Zealand at in that conversation? Well, guess what? We're having that grown-up conversation here. They're having it in Australia, they're having it in the UK, they're having it in Scotland and Ireland, and obviously in the US. So this is a grown-up conversation, actually. And it's time, I believe, that our church leaders had some respect, had some tolerance, and had some understanding, and actually take a leadership role in this issue. Because what is driving me and what is, I'm so passionate about are actually the Levi's and the young people of our country who are growing up in environments where they are undervalued, they are not respected, they haven't got the freedom to be safe uh, and to explore their sexual self-determination. So one of the things that we is that we live in a society that values and respects all citizens of our country. And so I uh, thank you all for coming out tonight, and I hope by the now we're going to have space for questions, uh, but I hope that our argument in the affirmative will mean that this house, that you support uh, marriage equality for New Zealanders. Kia ora. of a referendum uh, on the debate. You uh, have been asked to vote on these cards in front of you. Pass them down to the end of the row, on this side of the row. Pass them down this way. Um, I'm going to ask um, Kerwin and New Zealand, Young New Zealand first characters to please come around and collect those votes. And then you're all going to go outside and vote them as we do questions. For question time, I'm going to take maybe six or seven questions. I think that's all we have time for. Um, there's lots of people getting their hands up, so I think we've got a bit of a blocks going on maybe in supporters. So I'm going to take some from like about an equal number from each side of the room. So, who would like to ask a question? Um,